Sati Saham Pati Satnam Sri An Siwarang Ayacata Santi Prasatka Paracatta Chatika Tese Tuthamman Anukam Timan Pacham Namo tasa bhagavatu arahatu samma sambhutasa Namo tasa bhagavatu arahatu samma sambhutasa Namo tasa bhagavatu arahatu samma sambhutasa Bhutang Dhammang Sanggang Namasami So uh, last uh, time I spoke, a couple of weeks ago, I mentioned, well, in the context of Ajahn Chah's teaching about reading the mind. <clears throat> I mentioned in passing that uh, you have to take into account that the Ajahn Chah's teachings and especially the Buddhist teachings are very contextual. You know that word? <laughs> very situational, contextual. That means they were given in a special context. You know, to certain people, specific people, at certain time, a certain place. In other words, it's not to be taken as, you know, you know, you know absolute truth. Well, we better be careful here. <laughs> maybe it is, but <laughs> maybe in a different context, it doesn't, it isn't that way exactly, you know. It's a <laughs> better be careful of my language here. <laughs> Not denying what he says is true, but you know, <laughs> it applies in a specific context, see? <clears throat> mostly applicable, primarily applicable in a certain context. <clears throat> so I mean, it's, this is it may sound like a you know a simple point, or maybe not even an important one, but it does. I think it is a very important point, and I think most people have, don't really appreciate how, how important it is. Because if you don't understand that, then you, you know, take these different teachings, especially the ones you like, and say, this is the way, you know, what the Buddha said. This is what Ajahn Chah said. This is absolutely it. Yeah. And then you argue with somebody else who says, no, I heard him say <laughs> something else. <laughs> As it was at the, at the first council. I think it was the first council. Yeah, when they had when they had the first council after the Buddha passed away, then they uh, they they gathered to recite the Buddha's teachings. You know, and then it was <coughs> it was recited by Ananda the teachings, the uh, um, basic teachings, and then the Vinaya by then Upali recited them all, and then I don't know if they had some discussion afterwards, <laughs> but uh, they finally agreed this is what the Buddha said. And at the end of it, one of the monks said, oh, yeah, that may be well, but I heard the Buddha say. <laughs> he didn't say it in the group, but he said it <laughs> privately afterwards, you know, and went his own merry way, you know. But anyway, <laughs> <clears throat> but we have this body of teachings, but you got to be careful because, because they are contextual, you can take them out of context. You know, nowadays, like... Uh, well, in the, in the Buddha's time, the only way to receive instruction was to go to a teacher, face to face. They didn't have books in the Buddha's time. And in India, they didn't have any paper, so they couldn't make books. See? So you had, all the teachings were done orally, which meant that you went to a teacher and, you know, some even they didn't have the special ability to read your mind, but they could, you know, sense your interest or your personality and especially if you develop the rapport with the teacher, <clears throat> they'd get to know you as, you know, spiritually speaking, they'd get to know your 
temperament and your strengths, weaknesses, and they can advise you accordingly. But nowadays, you know, all we have to do is, you know, pick up a book of the Buddhist scriptures. If you can lift it, it's about that thick. <laughs> but it's readily available to everybody, you know, even non-Buddhists. You know, you can just go to a bookstore and get a book and read about the word of the Buddha, the, the, you know, the English translation, if you like, of the word of the Buddha. <clears throat> but, but then the Buddhists said many different things to different people. So you could, could end up just picking and choosing. You know, oh, I like what he said, you know. Like it's very common for people in the West. There's one of the teachings the Buddha gave to the Kalama people, the Kalama Sutta. Did you recite that tonight? Probably not, no. It's not one of the uh, Brittas, but <clears throat> it's about, it's, it's, a, it's the, the Kalama people seemingly were very spiritually advanced, you know, and then they, the Buddha came to that area where they lived and they came to him and they said they have some doubts because many teachers come here and they all say we have the right teaching, we have the, the right way to enlightenment or something, awakening or truth or something. And they're all different. <laughs> you know, there can be that many different paths to the truth. You know, some of them are even quite controversial. I mean, quite contrary to each other. So, which which one is the right one? So the Buddha didn't say, "I have the right one," <laughs> but he said, "Well, reflect on it yourself. You know, does this teaching, you know, lead to skillfulness or unskillfulness?" Is this helpful or not helpful? You know, and he gave these basic, it's, they say it's the, and he, and he said kind of quite, quite uh, categorically, don't believe you know, what, you, what you get from hearsay, don't even believe what you get from scriptures, <laughs> don't even believe what you get from teachers. <laughs> but when you reflect upon it yourself and realize this is helpful, this is skillful, and it leads to beneficial results, then you can accept it put it to the test. So it's been called by some Westerners the, the Buddhist uh, uh, doctrine of free inquiry. See? Of course, if you emphasize that, anything goes. Huh? <laughs> you know, eating supper in the evening is you know, good for my health, you know? <laughs> or, you know, it's like, you know, many different permutations of that, you know? What I like, you know, agrees with me, or is skillful, helpful for me, what I like. <laughs> but if you recognize it's given in the context of those people, okay, that's what they, you know, they, they maybe they needed at that time. You know, they were, they were so in awe of these, all these teachers telling them what to do. They said, wait a minute, hold it. You know, start thinking for yourself, you know, a bit more. Don't just, you know, believe everything you hear, but Think for yourself. Is this really skillful and helpful? You know, like one of the teachers in the India at the time, they say he didn't believe that killing was any problem. You see, so he said all you do is you just put a spear through the four elements. You know, it's not a person; it's just the four elements. No problem, <laughs> except for the person you spear, of course. <laughs> It was a bit too high-minded, you see. Okay, yeah, sort of one of the higher, you know, the, you can say in the higher teachings, just the, this body is the four elements, right? You know, but <laughs> we still have consciousness and feeling, you know? <laughs> so it's a bit too high-minded, you see. Anyway, I mean, the, the Buddha suggested to these people, but it doesn't apply in all situations. Other times, he very categorically told people, you know, just keep the precepts, keep the five precepts, the eight precepts, you know. <clears throat> but if you recognize that it's just these teachings are, are contextual, then, you know, we need to be a little bit, it implies we need to be a little bit circumspect in what teachings we give priority to. And most particularly because the Buddha's path of practice also is a, let's say, a progressive path. You know, it starts off with, you know, just like, just like the meditation instructions, start off with the basics, you know, and then once you get the basics, you know, if you're able to stabilize your attention on your breathing, 
maybe you can then bring your attention to the next stage of the mindfulness practices, uh, being aware of the, the bodily postures and being aware of the different parts of the body. <clears throat> but if you're trying to be aware of the parts of the body in the beginning and your breath isn't even stabilized, yeah, well, anyway, my mind does that. <laughs> or, or start to fantasize or <laughs> conceptualize, you know, you know, how many kidneys have I got anyway? I mean, <laughs> what do those kidneys look like? <laughs> and of course, they, they're probably much, your vision of them is much more attractive than they really are, <laughs> you know. You know, sometimes we, we try to use these, uh, these meditations, but, you know, maybe you have a, you get a, 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 a model of a body, you see, and then it's got, you know, you can, see, you can take out the organs, you see. So the lungs are green and the kidneys are red or something. <laughs> but, I, you know, I think in real life they aren't quite so attractive as this nice shiny plastic. <laughs> In fact, I know they're not. <laughs> but if your your attention is able to be stabilized on the breathing, you know, which is you know pretty pretty uh, ordinary for most people, <clears throat> it's not uh, un, un, unattractive or not attractive, uh, but more neutral. Then, when your mind is stabilized, perhaps you're able to look at these are called the exercises in asuba or unattractiveness, without having a reaction to them. <clears throat> You know, and if, if you recognize that these teachings are contextual, perhaps we understand them. We have to start off with, you know, that the exercises which are more suitable to our temperament, for example. You know, where are we at, you know, to be, I guess, to be wisely circumspect. I think it'd be helpful to have, keep in, in your mind somewhere that, you know, all, enlight, all unenlightened people are still subject to greed, aversion, and delusion, huh? Would you agree? Or are you still that, that deluded you don't? <laughs> and this uh, greed, aversion, delusion also spills over into spiritual life. You know, so you know, we have, you know, we have greed, but spiritually speaking, we maybe we have greed for enlightenment, huh? or greed for progress anyway. And this, is, this can be, a, you know, this is a, quite an issue with some Westerners, for example, our whole society is based upon, on the ambition side, being ambitious. You know, the early bird gets the worm and, you know, things like this, you know. Yeah, I was trained in the Protestant work ethic, <laughs> conditioned in the Protestant work ethic, you know. Work hard and get, make your, make your bread, get your bread and, you know. <clears throat> well, you bring it into spiritual life. So, and then maybe it's compounded by other factors, you know, like, when I was in, when I went to Thailand, for example, at that time, it was, you know, if you're interested in meditation practice, there were no opportunities in the West, as far as I knew, not in the area where I was anyway. So the only opportunity was to go to Asia, to Buddhist country. So here I traveled halfway around the world, to Thailand, for example. Is that halfway around the world from Canada? Roughly. <laughs> Didn't measure it. <laughs> it seemed like it was longer because I went overland. <laughs> so I got to Thailand and I was on a, I had a schedule, you see. And so I planned one month in Thailand, see, so I was in a hurry, you know. I got one month to get enlightened. <clears throat> of course, it didn't take me long before I realized it might take a bit longer. So then I gave myself two months. <laughs> But of course, I mean, that, that was, that's very unproductive or only unhelpful for meditation, isn't it? You're going to sort yourself out in limited time, you see. You know, but, uh, you know, you just have to be able to tune in to where your mind is at. And, you know, it could take, depends on the individual, but it could take, you know, it could take days, maybe, weeks. It could take months for your mind to settle down. Yeah, my, my first meditation retreat, I was also very ambitious, but, uh, and sometimes the mind, I, I did really try hard to do the exercises in Sri Lanka because didn't know where I'd end up. And sometimes the mind did quieten down, 
But then, because it wasn't really, the mind wasn't really well trained, and I was just, you know, grasping at straws, basically. I was just trying to hold on to it. Suddenly, suddenly it whew, changed like that. It flipped from being very peaceful to just being crazy again. <laughs> back and forth, back and forth. <laughs> I mean, it did allow the possibility, anyway, to taste a bit of tranquility in that very controlled environment. And probably I'm just lucky I didn't go crazy, too, you know. <laughs> because uh, you, it's like you're in a pressure cooker in those intensive retreats. You know, you, you can't escape, you can't talk, you can't read, can't write. And, you know, so it can be also very intense, especially when the mind goes, you know, the one with crazy spins. It's very, 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 very compounded or, or, or uh, strengthened, that, that experience. You know, it was really on the verge of, on the verge of really of craziness. Could easily just let go. <laughs> but, you know, the, if, if one continues with this practice, I mean, I think, you know, that uh, we have to recognize, keep in mind also the middle way, yeah, moderation, it's helpful. Maybe a contemporary the ambition part of it. You know, the Buddha said right energy, right, in the Eightfold Path, right energy. Not only just energy, but right energy. Sama, uh, vayamo, right effort. So you've got to reflect upon what's right effort. You know, some people, they really throw themselves into the practice. You know, a lot of energy. Uh, they, they try and sleep less and try to eat less and all that. And after a while, they just burn out. And uh, in our society, it is a bit more, you know, ambition orientated. So something like patience is not really highly valued, is it? Be patient, be patient, wait, you know. And this is what Ajahn Chah, I mean, I remember him emphasizing this a lot. Patience, patience, be patient. And I thought, yeah, yeah but I haven't got time. <laughs> what do you mean? Be patient, what do you mean? You know. <laughs> I remember one time he said, uh, kind of, I don't know if he's talking to me or not, but probably maybe he was, but he just said, oh, you know, he says, you know, you come here for, for, for wisdom. He says, well, I can't give you any wisdom, he said. All I can give you is patience. So, oh, this is a real downer. <laughs> I came to the great wise master for wisdom, not for patience. <laughs> It did take me a while before I realized the wisdom of that. You know, if you do, if you develop the practice, continue with the practice long enough, patiently enough, then wisdom will develop on its own, and it's the it's the it's the natural wisdom, not the, not the forced kind of wisdom that you're trying to, you know, copy from him or get from a book. It's the natural wisdom of you know just look, being able to look at impatience, for example. You can get wise looking at your impatience. I mean, wisdom is learning about yourself, isn't it? What's, what's really driving you? What's, uh, what's causing the confusion in the mind? And many times the confusion in the mind is caused by impatience. Yeah, yeah. right. You noticed? Not yet, maybe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I want results. Yeah, results aren't happening. Yeah. They aren't happening because you want them. You're greedy for them. You're grasping them. <laughs> You're trying to grasp them. But if you just can sit back and, and be patient with your wandering mind, eventually it gets tired of wandering and settles down. The trouble is we can't say when. <laughs> be patient. <laughs> and maybe it's, your, maybe it's your particular you know, path of practice, just being patient. Where for others, I mean, depending upon the context, you know, like, uh, I mean, just in general, you know, I remember Ajahn Chah emphasizing for the Thai monks, he would emphasize a lot of energy, you know. You know, you say, you know, speak little, uh, eat little, sleep little, talk little, you know, and, you know, and practice a lot, you know. And the Westerners, you'd more like to say, oh, relax, take it easy. <laughs> As many of the Thai monks, you know, it was the, the I don't know if they're just too patient, <laughs> a lot of them were, were uh, you know, 
young men from the, from the villages, so their sons are rice farmers. So you can't rush the rice, the rice growing, can you? <laughs> you do a lot of work to plant the rice, then you need to sit back and wait for it to grow, you see, for three months or so, four months. How long does the rice grow? Four months? You don't know, you're not a rice farmer. <laughs> huh? three, three, yeah, it depends on the, usually it's the, just the rainy season, so, rainy hot season, so three or four months. <clears throat> There's not much they can do. You know, just, uh, they don't even need to weed it, I don't think, do they? I'm not a rice farmer either, so I don't really know. But, be <laughs> but if, you're, if you're a gardener, for example, you know, you just have to be patient and let the garden grow. Maybe you do weed it a bit or add water once in a while, but... <clears throat> So by recognizing that the, the teachings are contextual, we need to sort of, you know, put them in the context of our own practice, you know, especially in, in terms of, you know, being honest with ourselves where we're really at in practice. You know, most of us have, have greed for the ultimate teachings, huh? And I want to, and usually it's, you know, sort of the, the highest teachings and the quickest way. Huh? <laughs> I remember some young students coming to see Ajahn Chah, some, some students from Bangkok. Well, they were, they had been students at university and then they were, had, had ordination temporarily. You know, it was a break between university. And so they were looking around the different teachers. So they came to Ajahn Chah and said, and they asked him, what's the easiest and fastest way to enlightenment? And he said, don't even try. <laughs> I don't think they appreciated the wisdom of that, you know, because it was, it was their trying to get enlightened that got in the way of their practice, you see. They were so, so they, had, they must have an idea what enlightenment is, and it's, I'm chasing it, you see. So it's the carrot before the horse, you see. So there's enlightenment just fading away out of their reach all the time, but you just don't try, and bingo, enlightenment is here if you realize it. <laughs> you know, the truth is always here, right? The truth is always present. We just don't see it. <laughs> it's not somewhere over there, or behind us, or up there anywhere. The truth is right here in front of us. But your mind just isn't in the right position to receive it, that's all. So we work with what we have, you know, this mind and body right here. <clears throat> But we also need to be, you know, wisely circumspect. <clears throat> because of the nature of delusion, you know, we usually just refer to practices which we like, which are easy for us. You know, we, don't, we don't listen to other teachings, you know. Well, the Buddha talked about, you know, kind of more, you know, like, uh, or the ascetic practices, for example. Like was very common in the West for you know, for meditation, for people who are interested in meditation practice, they want concentration, peacefulness of mind. But then you mention morality. Oh, silence. <laughs> but basically, if you haven't got a good, you know, say, a stable lifestyle, to put it simply, morality is to give us a stable lifestyle. You know, refraining from killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, intoxication. I mean, if uh, that stabilizes your life. You know, you can say it's, it's calming down the fires of uh, aversion for killing, uh, um, appropriate, appropriating, uh, stealing, you know, it's letting go of your desire for material things, uh, sexual misconduct is do with sensuality, chasing after senses, different sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, pleasant senses, sense and simulation, intoxication, you know, Confusing your mind, just uh, block, bl blotting out all your suffering. <clears throat> you know, if you if you stabilize your life away from those distractions, then it, it provides a very good base for concentration. You can say when your mind isn't obsessed with greed, you know, I mean, sensuality, uh, aversion, intoxication, isn't it peaceful? <laughs> Take away all those distractions, the disturbances, and your mind is already peaceful, yeah, to a certain degree. But if one doesn't have a stable lifestyle, then 
you know, sometimes then empowering the mind in concentration can be even dangerous. Because you're also empowering the mind, not just focusing on breathing, but when you go up, when your mind goes off the breathing, it can go in all kinds of remorse, regret, guilt, anxiety, fear. You know, so, you know, back to stabilizing your life again. <laughs> <coughs> But, uh, you know, people, they'll recognize, I mean, they, they, they have this, you know, preference for, you know, I was, I was interested in, medit in, in concentration meditation because I never heard of it before. In the, in the, say the even the Christian teachings I had, I was um, forced to listen to. <laughs> they didn't mention about concentration, you know. Although it was in the background, you know. I mean, if you really are focused on some higher power, you know, like many of these, these theistic religions, you know, if you really are focused on a higher power, you, you do have concentration. You know, but uh, they don't talk about that psychological aspect, they just talk about the higher power, you know, believe in that, you know, focus on that. You know, but when you do focus, that's concentration. <clears throat> And then many of these, you know, it's like the Christian mystics, some of them talked about, you know, having these visions and things. Hmm, sounds familiar. I don't know, it's like they have nimittas in Buddhist meditation, you know. I mean, they, of course, it was translated through Christian iconography, maybe, you know. Yeah, they see angels, we see devas, right? <laughs> some people see spaceships. <laughs> in their visions. <laughs> By the way, we, we, if we keep in mind, you know, the limitations of our, of our own particular mind, you know, recognize, okay, there are, there are these teachings available to us. It's like having a, a smorgasbord. You know what a smorgasbord is? You know, a feast, one of Annie's feasts laid out. <laughs> a Thai feast. <laughs> then you need to you know, see what's you can you can use your eyes to see what looks best, or or or, or I can I can't use my tongue really. Why can't I? <laughs> that before the blessing, but <laughs> but uh, I have to kind of listen to my body. You see, you know which one which one is hot, which one is <laughs> spicy. Which one, <laughs> what's uh, I know sure it'll be very tasty when it's spicy, but I know it'll have, have an effect afterwards. Negative effect, see. So, <clears throat> so you have access to all these teachings, but then you have to be attune yourself to okay, what's suitable for my temperament to me? I think one of the helpful ways of one of Ajahn Chah's teachings was he said, listen with your heart. You know, not, not with your, you know, you, and our, our brains tend to take in the information, you see. And you've got to remember this, but if you listen to your, from your heart, you can see what, what your response is to these different teachings. Sometimes you, you hear some teaching and you, oh, I don't like that. <laughs> but is it good for you? <laughs> you know? If your ego doesn't like it, but what's being disturbed is your ego. Really. So maybe I should try that. Maybe I should try that practice then. Or something other, you hear another teaching, oh, I like that, you know, like, like the high-minded ones, huh? I think most of us like really high mind. They talk about enlightenment, right? When you want everybody's ear perks up, enlightenment. Yeah. Talk about suffering, everybody, oh, you're ho hum. <laughs> but, the, but the kind of irony is it's through suffering you realize enlightenment, huh? So, so you don't just start at the top. Enlightenment first, I want enlightenment first, and then I'll get down to the nitty gritty later, you know. <laughs> when I'm wise enough and enlightened enough to handle it. <laughs> so the result is that, here's another word for you, uh, it can result in what we call, what's, what's been called spiritual bypassing. Yeah, spiritual bypassing is using spiritual practices to bypass the, the heavy stuff. You know, the, the work at the kind of conventional level like dealing with our greed, aversion, delusion. I mean, in order to really get wise, you need to face it, look at it, really understand what is greed, aversion, delusion, feel it in your own body and mind. 
and it's not very pleasant. But unless you go there, you're not going to find out what's behind it, what's conditioning it. So then you're not able to free yourself from it. You know, suffering, the cause, find the cause before you can get to cessation of it. And then you can have these glimpses occasionally, you know, glimpses, okay, can release that. But unless we do the practice, continue with the Eightfold Path, it's not going to become stabilized. You've got to make it part of our life then. You know, it's easy to, fairly easy anyway, when you're sitting in a nice, comfortable meditation hall, you know, and your mind's peaceful, and oh yeah, that's suffering, yeah, right, I see it, I see it, yeah. And then you step outside and somebody says, oh, watch out for that, don't step on an ant. Who are you telling me what to do? I mean, I'm just in enlightenment. <laughs> just have a glimpse of enlightenment. You're telling me that I'm making a mistake? <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Blown it. <laughs> it's much more harder to be enlightened. You know, as I think was Ajahn Chah said something like, you know, it's easy to be enlightened, it's just hard to stay enlightened. <laughs> That's what the real practice is about, staying enlightened you know, in everyday life. <clears throat> so we realize that you know, the, the teachings are contextual. And another one maybe I should mention you know, is that in some of the teachings, you know, the Buddha and even Ajahn Chah emphasized solitude. It's another one that Westerners sometimes have a bit of trouble with. Some of the teachings emphasize solitude, you know, going to the root of a tree or a quiet place to meditate. But in other contexts, the Buddha also mentioned that Kalyanamitta is the, the whole of the spiritual life. Noble friendship is the whole of the spiritual life. So how do you, how do you fit these together? Noble friendship and solitude. Unless you're, you know, in solitude with the birds or something. <laughs> Take the birds as your... <laughs> Noble friends, <laughs> just not that squawky <laughs> friar bird. <laughs> it doesn't give you much solitude. <laughs> but again, it's, it's very contextual, you see. If you look in your own mind, you see some time, or, or maybe you say that, well, maybe in those contexts, maybe, when somebody was very sociable, talking too much and easy, easy engaged with conversation, them to seek more solitude. And if somebody else was very, very quiet, withdrawn, didn't talk an awful lot, he might tell them, maybe you should, you know, find a, a good friend you can talk to and confide in and, you know, give you some support. <clears throat> Depending upon the context, you know. So unfortunately, some people, they just hear what they want to hear, see. The Buddha said solitude. Solitude, solitude. I'm going off into solitude, you know, because I hate people. You know. <laughs> so, okay, they, they have solitude, you know, in, in the, the right, you know, the spell it out, yeah, solitude, but not right solitude. <laughs> yeah. They're running away from, from challenges or difficulties, you know, running off to the quiet forest. Okay. And it's, it becomes an escape then. That's not right solitude. For other people, they say, oh, no, no, I have to go and, you know, and be in the, be in the community, <coughs> have noble friendship, and talk, 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 talk. <laughs> They're afraid of being with themselves alone for any time, length of time, you see. Yeah. So you have to be quite honest with yourself and look at the context. You know, what, you say, what, as the Buddha said, but to the Kalamas, the, the Kalamas, was it? Kalama Sutta, yeah. You know, see what is what is conducive to skillfulness. What is what is what is what is skillful? What is uh, conducive to lack of unskillfulness? You know, and in your own mind, you know what will lead to, you know, beneficial results and skillfulness. You know, am I running away from challenges to seek solitude, or you know, or do I try and find and you know, challenge that calmness in the midst of? I mean, it's the, the social order, the social community. <clears throat> What's more beneficial? And it's no absolute standard, you know, depending upon your own state of mind. You've got to check out your state of mind. 
Yeah, do I need some time for solitude, some time for, for group practice? What? Yeah. So I think, I think you know, personally, I think Ajahn Chah's approach was probably one of the most all-rounded, best rounded, because he does give, you know, there's group practice and there's time for your own practice, a bit of mixture, that you can get a, get a taste of both of them. And then see what, you know, what the results are. And sometimes maybe it's useful to, to try and interchange them, you see? Spend more time in solitude and see what the results are. Other times maybe you have to surrender to the community activities, see what the results are. You get too caught up with it. Uh, or can you maintain your, your calmness of mind within the busyness of the activities? So each one of us is different. We have different strengths and weaknesses, and we have different temperaments. And so, I mean, normally we just look at these great range of teachings we get from Ajahn Chah. Yeah, a great big thick book too. Yeah. All of the scriptures, more more big thick books. And we just pick and choose what we like. You know, oh, I like that one. I'll try that one. <clears throat> but you know, is it really suitable to our temperament? I mean, sometimes it's it's helpful to, to uh, do practices which sort of harmonize with your temperament to help calm the mind. The times it's helpful to challenge it. Otherwise, we can get very, very, you know, habitual in our practice. I can only practice alone. I can only practice in a group. You know, I, oh, I need constant group practice to, to wake me up in the morning to, you know, keep me and keep me practicing. Some people, maybe they don't practice unless there's a group meeting they have to go to. Yeah. Others, you know, they, they can't stand the group practice. I've got to be always, I need more tranquility, you know. But helpful to be flexible, isn't it? Yeah, we can't always pick and choose. <clears throat> and see the results. You know, maybe it's something which is not very, you don't like very much, it can be a very great source of wisdom. Because, you know, why don't you like it? What's being stirred up? You know, what's being, what's being, what's being triggered here? Aversion, greed, whatever. You, know, you have to really look at it. That can give you the, the source of the suffering. Unless we're, you know, forced into it, most of us wouldn't go there, right? Wouldn't go to the unpleasant. Huh? But are we ever free of it? There's always something around in there. <laughs> until you're able to really let go of it all, you know, beyond it all. Yeah. Good, bad, yeah. pleasant, unpleasant, it's all the same. Yeah. So when we understand that these teachings are contextual, I mean, there's, then there's a lot to choose from, you know. I mean, and, and most importantly, we, we recognize what is the teaching appropriate to us at this particular time in practice right now. Not uh, reaching too far, you know, for the ultimates. Yeah, I can just uh, keep thinking about non-self, non-self, non-self. Yeah, but when, whenever the, whenever I get hungry, there's a big self there. <laughs> We're tired or whatever, <laughs> irritated. <laughs> so we, 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 that means we also need to, it implies we have to put these teachings into practice and find out. Are they beneficial? Are they beneficial for us? But try them out first and see. Then we'll know, know for ourselves, just like the Kalama people. Then they know, oh yeah, right. That's how it works. Yeah, in this particular context, this particular time. Then we later need to find something else, some different, a different skillful means to apply. Yeah, let's begin to uncover the various levels of our delusion, if you like manifest in different ways, so you got to keep on your toes. So, is that, that, is that uh, too much of a challenge? <laughs> but uh, what, else, what other choice have we got? Huh? <laughs> Enlightenment or suffering? <laughs> so I think this is enough for your contemplation this evening.